There's also a, an area that I want us to pray about. It won't be long before we start back to school. And one of the things that's going on in the United States at this time uh, is starting to get in our school system. It's called critical race theory. And teachers are beginning to teach young people, elementary school, middle school, and high school about a critical race. Now that doesn't sound too bad on the outside, but actually what it is is they're teaching young children that if you're white, you're the oppressor. And if you're black, you're the oppressed. 
And that's the way it is. That's the way it's going to be your whole life. And that there's problems with that. We talk about white privilege just because of the color of your skin. You've got privileges that others don't have, and I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes. Those things we need to be aware of, especially if you have children or grandchildren, and even if you don't. We don't need our society to change in that direction. I know when I was growing up through the 60s and 70s, we went through that whole system of getting away from it, of uniting, of becoming better than what we were. There are certain groups, Black Lives Matter and others, that want to pull us back into that. We need to fight that. We need to be aware of it. We need to pray about it so we keep those things out of our schools. If they come into your schools, as some of it already is, you need to fight it. If you need help, let me know. <laughs> Another part of it is tithing off. That's how we get we pay the bills and everything else. So if you will, please, on your way out, if you'll put your tithing offering in the uh, cup in the back, we'd certainly appreciate that. For those of you at home, mail it in to us. Bring it by. Come and see us, and we'll talk to you for a while. Have a great day in the house of the Lord. morning is a responsive reading and I'm going to ask you all to stand and join me. Lord, we give thanks for your goodness and your love and we now draw near to enjoy your presence. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. We lift up our hearts and bring you our worship and praise. In our praying, God will provide the answers. In our listening, God will provide wisdom. In our need, God will provide the blessing. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We lift up our voices and sing to you our worship and praise. We'll sing song number 358, Crown Him with Many Crowns. We'll sing the first two verses after the band gives us an introduction.
but you've already heard the uh, concerns uh, of the congregation. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to spend time in prayer, not just here, but at home. Uh, we shouldn't be waiting for Sunday uh, to, to, to implement the things that we should be doing Monday through Saturday as well. So I would encourage you to be praying uh, as often as the Lord brings them to your memory. Don't forget. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to be gathered in your house with your people to look into your word together. Um, what an amazing privilege we have. And I pray that we don't ever take that for granted. As we have come through this past year and we've uh, experienced some of this uh, isolation that was in a lot of ways forced upon us by something we couldn't see or touch or taste and yet devastated so much of, uh, of so many families and so much of our, of our nation. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. And so this morning, we want to come together as a body of believers, not as individuals doing our own thing, but as a, as a body, as, a, 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 as the church, communing with you and the things that are important to you, the hurts that you, uh, you are aware of should become our hurts, the joys that you experience should become our joys. And so, Father, this morning as we are also knowing that our hurts are your hurts as well. Our concerns are your concerns. Our joys are your joys. And so this morning we pray for those who uh, are not well. You know each individual person and their situation and their their concerns. We pray that you would be close to them. That you would bring healing to them and relief and comfort. Father, you know we just had a memorial service just yesterday. We know that the pain and the sorrow are still raw. And so for Major Christine and her family, we pray again a special awareness of your presence, your comfort, your peace, and yes, Lord, your joy. While we may not be able to see it just yet, we know the day is coming when you will make all things right. We pray for those who have experienced their joy. We heard uh, just earlier today that Colonel Hop's daughter sold her house. Lord, that, that seems like such a mundane thing, and yet it's important to her, and therefore it's important to you. And so we give joy, and we give praise, and we give glory to you for arranging things just so for that to become a relief to her. Father, for our core, we pray, yes, we want more people to come into this, this room here. We want it to, to burst it, it seems. But even more, we want to be mature believers. We want to be on fire for you, whether we're in this building, or at work, or at school, or at home, or wherever we may find ourselves. We want people to know that we are your people. Even if we don't say a word, may they know that by the way we live our lives. So, Father, as we worship together today, we acknowledge your presence. Where two or more are gathered, you're there. We certainly have more than two. So we know you're here. And we pray that everything that we say and everything that we do here honor you and build works to build your kingdom within us as well as without. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
reading the selected scripture from the New International Version. This is Paul speaking. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you may answer those who take pride in what is seen, rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. He died for all, and those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in that way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who recon reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, as he has committed to us a message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though we were making, he was making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for it says, In the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. Read the book at home. You'll know how to live. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture reminded us that as co-workers, so we're all in the body of Christ co-workers, and so we are to trust and obey. So would you stand with me, and we're going to sing together when we walk with the Lord.
used to this place. <laughs> switch microphones just a bit, because I was, as I told you a couple weeks ago, I'm a wonder. I don't like staying in one place. Uh, I lock my knees, and then I might just pass out, and nobody wants that. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, and, and, you know, my wife is uh, really disappointed that she's not with us this morning. Uh, some of you know from uh, if you were here yesterday from the memorial, you kind of shared some things uh, individually, but I'll share. I don't think it's inappropriate for me to share with the with the congregation because she has seen firsthand the power of a group of people that have been praying for. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a, a group of close friends that have known from the beginning everything that's been going on, and uh, and, and she and has testify to what God has done over the last six months or so. Um, actually, even further than that, because it could have been and should have been a lot worse than what it turned out to be. And so, I'm sharing with you, because you are the poor family. You are the people who are going to be praying for us for the next however long the army elects to leave us here. Average is three to five years, but who knows? We could see this being a long-term relationship. We would love that, actually. But let me tell you what, uh, what's, what's happened. Um, she went in for her first round of chemo. Um, let me back up a little further. She did have surgery. They did remove uh, some tissue that, um, long before we, um, back in March, she, she had the surgery. They did remove some tissue that they determined was cancerous. Um, and however, they felt like they got it all. However, they were not able to get lymph nodes to be able to test and to ensure that they got everything. She went through a PET scan, PET scan came out clear. All good news, we were celebrating. However, again, her doctors were saying, but without the lymph nodes, we don't know. There could be some microscopic traces still left. And so we're gonna prescribe a round of chemotherapy followed by radiation. So she went in for her first round of chemo on Thursday. Friday, she felt great. Friday night, she started feeling a little, little unsettled in her stomach. Saturday morning, she was very sick to her stomach, not to the, to, not to the ultimate point. Thank goodness. A um, little Pepto helped an awful lot. But then as the day wore on, she started experiencing a great deal of pain just throughout the body. Um, something that we don't recall them telling us was a side effect. Um, maybe they did, maybe we didn't hear it, but uh, she has been racked with the pain uh, all day yesterday and into this morning. No sleep at all. So she was in tears about not being able to be here this morning with you. But I am telling you this, not because she's asked me to, but because I think it's the right thing to do, because we need your prayers. We come thus far, we know God is in the middle of it, we know his presence is with us, we just want to keep that prayer going and, and expand that circle so that more people are praying for her. Um, it's a round of six treatments over 18 weeks. So we got one down, five to go. Uh, and we're, we're holding on to that encouragement. Um, now, I started, uh, and, and, I, and I asked some questions when I got here because I wasn't sure if, let me try to find an easier way around this. I will talk in circles if I'm not careful. In 2021, Divisional Headquarters introduced a theme for the Florida Division, uh, trying to emphasize the commitments that we make as soldiers and, as, and really as believers. Um, you'll see that it's the, the theme is called uh, God's Army, um, Called and Battle Ready. Now, I don't believe, as in questions I've, that I've asked to this point, that you have really done a lot with this theme other than what uh, Colonel Strissel did with his Marks of a Healthy Church, which I think dovetails right into what we're really talking about. Um, I want to do, we're going to focus on that third item right there. There's four emphasis, one of four, how that worked out really well. Um, we're going to focus on the third one because we are right now in the third quarter, but I will talk briefly about the first two um, because I think those are important to set that groundwork. 
Um, and again, they, you know, in their <coughs> generosity, headquarters has provided some um, uh, items that will help to reinforce the, those four themes um, that you see there. Um, and currently, there's a bookmark and a magnet in the basket on the table out in the south side of the door here. Uh, that the bookmark has a list of scripture readings for the quarter that uh, will help to emphasize those uh, again those those that theme for this quarter. There's also a magnet you can put on your refrigerator, you can put on your locker at school, your locker at work, wherever you are. That again emphasizes that theme. I am a, uh, I, I, I'll be a disciple. But look at those those uh, first uh, those themes that are there, uh, and we're going to just briefly just mention those, and then I'll get into uh, really summarizing the the other two before I get into the, the, this one. First is I worship the true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as His living sacrifice in everyday life, and as part of a worshiping community. The second, I grow as a disciple of Jesus. Seeking mature holiness in joyful community and fellowship with other salvationists. Third is I seek and reach out to others who are lost to invite them to Jesus and to disciple them to full salvation. It's not elsewhere, but I just want to just not remind everybody. It's not enough just to get saved, really. God calls us to, to be saved and then to move on to holiness, to discipleship. And that's, it, we've got a lot of orphan Christians running around. We need to make sure they grow to be mature believers as well. The fourth is, I serve our community, especially the poor and marginalized, as God's love extends through me to others, positively affecting my community. And so the question for all of us today is, are we really true soldiers of Jesus? Or maybe we're ready, we're in that place in our, in our discipleship, in our own life, that we're ready to commit to, do, to doing that. Uh, and this is not true just for soldiers. As I've mentioned, it's true, it should be true for all believers. It's not, we have to move, move on beyond the infancy stage of, of our faith and move on to maturity. Um, we are called and invited to be faithful soldiers of the King, whether we're salvationists or other believers, soldiers for the small s of the King. We are called to live for Christ. All right, first of all, the first one is, I, I, I'm going to summarize this. I, I have full sermons on these first two items. I can make those available to anybody that wants them or not. Um, I don't know if we want to post them somewhere or if, I, if you want to, you know, me to send you something. We can do that. Just ask. We'll figure it out. We've got some really tech-savvy people here in this court, which I'm grateful for. It's not just me anymore. Uh -huh. We can figure it out. But worship him with it your whole life, right? I worship the true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as his living sacrifice in everyday life. That comes directly from, uh, from Romans 12, doesn't it? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual, or as other translations say, your reasonable act of worship. It's reasonable for us to give our everything to God because he gave his everything to us. Now, what is worship? Well, it's simply acknowledging that God is worthy of your very best. Right? Of your everything. It comes from the old English word, worth sheep, which is a condition of being worthy. God, is, and I know there's some training officers here who probably remember this. So I'm, I'm telling you, I learned something in trade, okay? Um, it's a condition of being worthy. God is worthy. He is worthy of you getting up on Sunday morning and putting on, and, and taking a shower, thank you, and getting dressed, thank you again, and coming to the core. He's worthy of that time, of that energy, of that effort. He's worth it. I hope you would know that. Um, it used to be that some people, I would hear some people say, I have to go to church today. And I said, no, no, I don't have to go. I get to go. I get to go to church. I get to be in God's house with God's people looking at God's word. And I'll give you, this is a freebie, and I'm probably, probably going to extend everything, and I'm sorry for this, but I just want you to know, if anybody wants to know how to be a stronger and a better Christian, there are three things you got to do. 
It's really easy. It's not even up on slides. This is a freebie, okay? First of all, you got to spend time with God in prayer. you got to hang out with God in prayer. you got to listen to him. you got to hang out in God's word. you got to know what he said. And a lot of times, you know, we pray and we ask for God's response, but there's some, he's already told us in his word what he wants. And we expect something different. No, no, listen to what God is saying to you already by hanging out in his word. This is the third one, and everybody knows the first two things, but they don't, what they tend to forget is the third one. You got to hang out in God's house with God's people. You just have to. We were not made to be alone. We see that a lot in, in this emphasis. You'll see that in that idea of, of being in joyful community with other believers, right? All right, I'm going to step on some toes. I hope you brought your, your steel toed shoes. Because you're going to worship, you also need to worship Him with our treasure. Right? What does Jesus say? Don't store up treasures for you on earth. But instead, lay up your treasures in heaven, right? And, and, and I think we have to also remember that Jesus spoke more about money and possessions than he did about heaven and hell. Why is that? It's because those are the things that get us into trouble. Those are the things that distract us from our relationship with the Lord. When we put anything else in front of him, it becomes an idol to us. Whatever it is. Um, understand what I'm, and again, do not hear what I'm not saying. Money itself is not evil. It's not. It's, it's a tool. It's something that we use. And the scripture is very clear that it is not money that's the problem. It's the love of money. It's placing value in something that was meant to be used to take care of, of, of our needs as well as to ensure that other people have what they need. So, just be aware of, the, of that and watch out for those things. And the third is one that we don't hear an awful lot of, and you'll hear me say it a lot because I am convinced of this very fact, and that is we have to worship him in community. A lot of times people take this the passage, uh, the verse from Genesis 3, where, the, where, again, the only time that God ever said that something wasn't good in creation was when he said, it is not good for man to be alone. They take that as, a, as, as something to be used as, as, as in a wedding service. And I see the value there. But I think it's bigger than that. I think what God is saying is it's not good for anybody to isolate themselves, to be alone. We were not made to be alone. We were made to live in community with each other. Uh, if we are truly in the image of God, and if God exists in, in a triunity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, He lives, He exists in an entire, in an eternal uh, relationship. It makes sense that we were made to be in community with others, in relationships with others. And we, I'm going to confess to you, I'm an introvert. When I leave this place, I will go home and I will crash hard because all my energy is being used here. I would rather be in a corner somewhere with a good book. But I understand that I cannot live my life like that because that's not how I was created. God intended for us to have these relationships with each other. And this verse from, uh, from William Booth, uh, it takes it even a step further and, and really challenges us. Every home should be definitely, as definitely and truly consecrated to the service of God as the Salvation Hall, as this place. Your home should be a place of discipleship, a, dis a place of worship. It needs to be a temple where he is loved and worshipped and in which he can reveal himself, pour out his spirit, and hold communion with his children. And parents, it is our responsibility. Maybe I should say your responsibility. I don't have our children of our own. But parents, it's your responsibility to do that, to set that example, to be the model. You realize that a, first, a child's first idea and understanding of who God is is the example of their parents. They learn, they, they, they make the decisions and determinations about the character and the nature of God based on the examples that they see in their parents. An awesome, terrifying burden that is. 
But if we are living our lives as disciples of Jesus, if we are truly worshiping him with our entire lives, we will make every place around us a place of worship. One of my favorite little books is The Practice of the Presence of God. You can read that in an afternoon if you really try hard. Um, and, and, and the author of the book was a, a, a lay a brother in a, in a monastery in, I want to say, 17th century France. And he wrote a series of letters. And in these letters, he revealed that everywhere he went and everything he did, he did as an act of worship. And he found especially uh, rich was his time when he was washing dishes. Now, I hate to wash dishes. I really do. I love, I, I love dishwashers. You can't wash everything in a dishwasher. So I end up doing a lot of that. But in, that, in, but in the experience of washing dishes, he used that as a time of communion, of worship. You don't have to be here on a Sunday morning listening to the, the band tell you these amazing songs and reading these great scriptures. You don't have to be here to worship God. Now, that's dangerous for the pastor to be saying that. But it's true. Now, again, do not hear what I'm not saying. We need you here. We need to the relationship. We need the communion of the saints here. But you can have a communion with the Lord. Washing dishes. Vacuuming the floor. Um, just hanging out with your with, with, with your family. Um, we need to move on because I could spend all day on that and I don't want to. <laughs> the second thing is I'm, I'm a disciple, right? We not only do you worship God, but now you're going to grow as a disciple of Jesus. You're going to want to move on from that first experience of salvation on to holiness. Because the scripture in James, in James is very clear. Without holiness, no man is going to see God. And in our doctrine, he even says, it is a privilege for believers to seek out holiness. So we need to grow in our holiness. Uh, and I love what Peter writes in, in, in his first letter. It says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Love it. Get ready. Roll up your sleeves. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in it. Stuff you used to do back then, you don't do no more. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, we find it in Leviticus 11.44, Be holy because I am holy. We are to speak of holiness when we discuss discipleship and training. It's not just about evangelism. We need to move on in our own lives from that experience to a richer, deeper experience, an awareness that we need more of God in our lives. What we have is, is a taste. We, need the, we want the full meal. Understand this, we're not just growing in our intellect, we're not just becoming smarter and more aware of what the Bible tells us. We're growing, and we're not growing more diligent in our work. We're not, you know, harder workers. The idea is to grow in holiness, set apart to God, and becoming more like Jesus, taking his nature and being transformed into his image. That's the goal of all of us. We do this in community. William Booth agreed with John Wesley. Uh, he said he did it right. Making strong disciples, not just by getting people saved, but by organizing people into small groups, usually in their private homes, where they could walk this Christian walk together. That's the word, together. They were vulnerable, they were real with each other, they encourage each other. They share prayer requests with each other. They even confess sins with each other and work through to make being disciples together. Folks, I'm, again, I'm convinced churches succeed or fail on, what, on how they interact with each other. You can, oh, and don't get me wrong, you can come and still be part of the church and come and sing songs and read scripture and hear a sermon and not be connected to each other. It's a, it's, a, it's a habit. It becomes a social thing. It becomes a club. That's not what the church is supposed to be. We care for each other. We build each other up. We live with each other and for each other.
for each other as the Lord leads us. I was very intentional yesterday when I, when I said to Major Christine here, I said, I said to her, and I'm, those of you that weren't here, let me tell you what I said. I said this very thing. We will walk with you during this time of sorrow. And when you can't walk, we will carry you. And that's what the church does, folks. We bear with each other. We carry each other when, the, when, when they can't carry themselves. Because there's going to be a time when you can't carry yourself. And I love this quote from, um, from John Wesley. Holy solitaries. People who like to do their, their own thing. The, the, uh, um, the myth of, of, of the lone hero is just doesn't work in the church. Holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. I mean, can you, can you get any more blunt than that? Holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. Jesus came to this earth. What did he do? He saw about 12 people, 12 men, to, to surround himself. Of those 12, he had three that were especially close to him. And out of that three, he had one that he confided in more than, a, more than any others. Jesus himself, God, the second person of the Godhead, came to earth, and what did he do? He surrounded himself with people. Okay? The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social. No holiness but social holiness. Now, you got to remember, okay, um, John Wesley was in the 18th century, and uh, his word, you can, he may be using the word social, and I realize that's a politically charged word today. When he means social, he means us. He means each other. He means all of us together. I cannot be as, I cannot be the fully, uh, fully committed, fully sanctified believer without you. Because I need Jesus in you so that, I can, so that I can learn more about how to be Jesus for others. And it works that way as well. So when you stay away because, oh, it's a pretty day, I think I'll go to the lake, you're, the, you're denying the presence of Jesus to someone who may need to see you. Or maybe, oh, it's, oh, you know, maybe I just, whatever the, whatever the story is, um, we need that. We need that commitment to be solid, uh, to be to live and learn in communities. We are disciples. We are not disciples in isolation. How can I learn to love others if I'm all the time by myself? That doesn't make any sense, does it? I, like I said, I can. I, I, would be, gee, I would be thrilled to just take a good book, sit in the corner somewhere, and I'll never have a relationship with a person. But how can I love them if I don't have a relationship with them? It doesn't work. Love is action. It's not that feeling within you. It is a giving and caring for others. And we grow as a disciple in community. And then third, here, we, uh, we as a disciple, we learn a mission. Mission isn't, and we have to know, mission is what, is that when God sends us out to do something, there's, again, we don't get saved just to have Good, good meetings together. We're saying to do something. What did, uh, what did, what did William Booth say to his son who, when he saw, when, when William Booth saw men sleeping up under a bridge? I, love, I still love this because it just, it just sounds perfect uh, to me. He sees men sleeping up under a bridge somewhere in London. He goes home, this, goes to his son, Bramwell, and he looks at him and he tells him what he saw, and then he says, do something. Here's your marching orders, folks. Do something. Okay, um, that's mission. Mission isn't mission isn't the result of discipleship. It's not because of what what you what you've already learned. It's it's part of your discipleship. It is uh, um, the method of discipleship, not the end result. To serve others is to let Him transform me. We become become more like Jesus as we serve others. And mission is how we grow as a disciple. In John 14, 6, Jesus referred to himself as the way. Paul said he was a follower of the way. And uh, this means that he is, that Jesus is the path of righteousness that, alert, that leads us to eternal life. Discipleship is related to missions in that the goal of missions is what? 
to make more disciples. A number of years ago, in my second appointment, I went to a church growth kind of presentation. Uh, it was more of an outreach presentation. And uh, they shared with me, this was a bunch of years ago, and I don't know, but I suspect not much has changed since then. They said, uh, what is the, the, the question, they gave a survey to church members around the country, and they said, what is the, uh, what is the purpose of the church? And the majority of responses there were, the church is, is there to meet my needs and the needs of my family. That was overall the number one re purpose of the church. And the folks that were making the presentation said, you know, that's, that's, not, what, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, um, the purpose and, and the mission of the church is to make more disciples. You can't do that in these walls. And the outcome of discipleship, of true discipleship of Jesus, is, is going to lead to more people becoming involved in missions, whether they're overseas missions. God bless you for, for your service overseas, those of you that, that have served. Um, you know, I don't believe that God ever called me to that, but I see the value of it. But sometimes missions can be just right here at home. There are people that don't know Jesus that are probably next door to you. That may be, you know, the next cubicle at your workplace. That may be in the in a classroom with you at school. Your mission could be right here in this in this country. It could be overseas. Wherever it is, you need to follow. Discipleship is not experiencing the new life offered by Jesus and then retreating from the world to enjoy those blessings all alone. Remember, we are connected to each other. It means following a road and one that can at times be challenging, but the end result is the establishment of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven here on earth as it is in heaven and a life lived eternally in the presence of our creator and redeemer. Now, I, I, I've, been, I've spent way too much time on those. Let's get on to the, 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 this, this third emphasis. That I am a discipler. Okay? It's important for us to become disciples, but what is the chief end of our becoming a disciple? Well, you got a mission. What is that mission? To disciple others as well. Right? Um, Jesus said in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and what? Make disciples. That's your job as believers, right? Um, and he promises that he will be with us always. He's not saying go do it by yourself. He's saying, no, I'll be with you. I'll be with you when you, when you do this. You just got to do it. And so we need to in invite and encourage others to discover this new life and encourage them to want to grow in it, just like he's teaching us. So part of the mission, to encourage our brothers and sisters in the faith, like iron sharpening iron, we need each other can't do it without, without each other. And another part is to introduce others to this new life in Christ. We want more. We're not happy with us four and no more. We want more. Right? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. And I, and I love, I just love to hear Colonel Morrow speak. I mean, you can just read the phone book and I've listened to it. Uh, it's just got that voice, man. That's it. Um, those of you may not know, we did a virtual, in my last appointment, we did a virtual kettle kickoff because of COVID. I asked to Colonel Morrow to narrate that, and I just love, I love, I love editing that together, just listening to it over and over again. <laughs> I'm a fan, so um, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate it today as well. But this is what he said. This is what Paul wrote. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Sorry, you can't read that. That's so small. <laughs> Um, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us now the message of reconciliation. He's like, okay, guys, I showed you how to do it. Now go do it, right? I'm giving you everything that you need, all the tools, all, all, all of the, everything that you need, it's yours. I showed you how to do it, and you need to go do it. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though, Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And the gift, this gift, this gift of, the, of this message of reconciliation is the task of bringing people together. 
God is no longer counting our sins against us. That's news. And that's good news. As a soldier, I am his ambassador to tell other people, hey, guess what? God is not going to hold your sins against you. You need to just, you need to accept that and, 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 and receive what he has for you. And having received a message from the king, I am to take it to others. I'm sent with a message from the king of light into a world of darkness. And again, not only do we get to come to church, we get to tell others about this loving and caring and saving and helping God. I love salvation with music. I mean, I'm a little eclectic. I like a, a pretty wide range of music. So I'll listen to band music. I'll listen to uh, uh, contemporary worship. I'll listen to world music. Uh, whatever, you know, there's just a wide range of it. I'll, I'll listen to it. But I love one of my favorites is this one right here. We are witnesses for Jesus. Where? Where it's safe? No. We are witnesses for Jesus in the haunts of sin and shame. In some of the worst places that we can go. What did, what did William Booth say? Go for souls and go for the nicest people? Go for the, 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 the popular people? Go for the wealthy people? No, go for souls and go for the worst. And you can read that on two levels. The worst kind of people in the worst kinds of situations. And expect that. Expect that. Tell the world. Make salvation story heard in the highways and in the byways. And in lands beyond the sea. Do some witnessing for Jesus. Wherever you may be. I love that song. Don't ask me to sing it because we will empty this chapel in a hurry. If I try. This is what a soldier is. We tell the world. We witness. And sometimes in the worst places. And part of being a disciple of others is simply talking. Telling people your story. See, your story. Uh, people underestimate the value of their story. Their story has value. It has power. Why? Because it's your story. It's true. You know it. And they, nobody can say that it's wrong. It's your story. Uh, and, and all we have to do is just tell people our story. There's power there. You may not feel that you're an evangelist. Okay? Some people are incredibly gifted at evangelism. Brigadier Jim Henry, my wife's uncle, great uncle. Man, he was. The man was an evangelist, there's no doubt. I've never seen this in anywhere else. And if I hadn't have been there, I would have said it couldn't be possible. But I've seen the man in a, uh, uh, preaching a revival service, and all he said was, y'all know you need to get down here. And the altar was filled. That was his appeal. That's somebody who has the gift of evangelism. I don't have that gift. But we can still evangelize. We just tell our story. That's it. That's all we do. And we bring him in, in the tiniest ways and see what he does with it. Because even with things as humble and as small as loaves and fishes, he does amazing things. And even when we bring his word in in tiny places, he will do amazing things with it. Reggie McNeil, who wrote the books Kingdom Come and Kingdom Collaborators, suggests this. He says, our conversation has, rate has to go up before our conversion rate can go up. It is not enough to bring people into this place and expect that uh, whatever I say is going to convince them that they need to get saved. The reality, folks, is that it's not the shepherd who gives birth to the lambs, but the sheep. I can do my part, but I need you to do your part as well. I need your conversation rate to go up. Um, we need to talk about it. We need to tell our story. And to keep this gift to ourselves, but I think the value of the gift, we try to hold it. It's like the, it's like the man who buried his talent, right? It didn't earn anything. And when we, when we do that, when we take this gift and we don't do anything with it, we're devaluing the gift. Now, have you ever received a box of chocolate as a gift? Maybe at Christmas time? No, that's one thing. I, I, you know, listen, you want to, I, I'm, 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 
I'm a sucker for a big box of chocolate. I don't like the, uh, I don't care much for the, the, the jelly ones and the soft ones. You give me something with nuts, man, I'm in heaven. We're in good shape there. But I love the seeing the box of chocolate and seeing what's there. But let's imagine that someone's brought to you a box of the best chocolates in the world. Now, you got a choice here. Which, what are you going to do? <coughs> Sorry. Right in there, and I got stuck. You got a choice. What are you going to do? You could eat the whole box yourself. I know some people who would do that. Good friends of mine. They would say, it's mine. If you try to reach for a drop for, for a piece, you're going to draw back in the All right? Uh, now, you could keep it for yourself, stash it away somewhere, just have a piece at a time. Or you can enjoy a piece, maybe two, but then take the box around to other people and say, man, you have got to try this. This is incredible. This is the best chocolate we've ever had. You need, this will change your life. I've said that to people, not with chocolate. Um, you have to ask me about kolaches sometimes. Because if you've ever had kolaches, you know. Those will change your life, man. Uh, they really will. You go to Texas, I have to get some. In our last appointment, there was a donut shop that actually made kolaches, like I remember getting in Texas. Oh my heavens. It was all I could do to drive by there every day and not stop. Mm. Anyway, that's another freebie there. I'll tell you about them later. I'm a kolache evangelist. Um, we have to share this good news. We, have, we, we get to share this great news. It is a privilege to do that, to share and to teach others. Um, it's, it's incredibly important that we as believers don't just keep it to ourselves. Don't just come and sit and have a great sermon and hear great music or get to play great music even. You know, there's so many people who don't realize how wonderful God is. My wife is going to be the person who's going to testify that because she has seen it firsthand. She has not just seen it, she's experienced it firsthand. And they don't know what they're missing. They don't know it and they don't, and they don't know what they're missing. We have to help them desire him. We need to realize, they need to realize their need for him. And we get to help them taste and see how God, good God is. Oh my God. Goodness. Do you even really truly know? Um, I'll put that up there because this reminds me of um, this faith that we're in is not a spectator sport. We don't get to sit and watch other people do it. We are called to be part of it ourselves. It does us no good, again, to hear all of the good things that God has done for us and then not get involved. I was looking for actually a cartoon that I, and I, I have it somewhere in my files, <laughs> still packed away. Uh, these two knights sitting outside of the castle on a bench. One of them looks at the other one and says, "Hey, give me a whack with your hammer a few times, make it look like I, I look like I saw some action." Sometimes I think that's what we, what we do, right? We, we sit on the bench and we watch other people do the do the work that God is calling all of us to do, and then we want we hope that somebody thinks that we, we were involved. We're not bench warmers. We even have to be participants. We have work to do. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's messy. People are messy. Colonel Hopter and I were talking about that just, just before the service started. About people being, you know, people being people. And guess what? I'm messy. I have issues. Just like all of you do. But God is working on me, and I get to be in this place right now, where right here, where I get to hear and learn from the collective wisdom and experience, and I get to have that build me up even more. People are messy, but understand this: it is not ugly, heavy work, because we are not alone. We are not. We are promised that God will be with us no matter what. It's glorious work. It's exciting to see when, when people make connections with, in, their, in, in their faith and that light bulb goes on. You have no idea how 
gratifying, how satisfying that is. And just know that, yes, the Lord used me in some small way to help somebody get further along the road. And I hope that somebody will help me get a little further down the road as well. The world is broken. All you got to do is turn on the TV. Cotton Presley, one of the, I don't know, a lot of people know who Cotton Presley is. He, uh, I remember hearing him say that he didn't watch TV news. He said, because uh, he can tell you what it is. He said, you turn on TV news and see that you know, there's, always, there's always a car that's upside down on fire and people are mad. He said, turn on the TV a couple weeks uh, um, prior to saying that, and guess what? All he saw were a car upside down on fire, people mad. The world is broken. All you got to do is turn the TV on. What? What? God is in the business of bringing the beauty of his kingdom to invade the darkness of this world of pain and sorrow. And we are recruited to help. Um, the quote that comes from, I think I have a little bit of a, a few problems with the, with the, how it, with the through line of that quote. But I like the first line. The broken world awaits you. God is calling us to enter into a broken world to be ambassadors and messengers of reconciliation, bringing broken pieces back together again, broken people, <coughs> making the introduction to the one who can restore, redeem, and make people whole. Colonel Jewett yesterday referred to um, the word that's used a lot. Uh, for some other things, but it's that Hebrew word of shalom. And shalom is not just peace. It all has to do with wholeness, of being made whole, being made complete. And that's what, that's what the broken world needs you to bring a message of wholeness, of shalom into it. You're ready for that challenge, and I hope you are too. I know you've been working on this battle plan. And I know this battle plan has, is going to have a lot of things that have to do with what we've talked about. Worship and discipleship and mission. And we need everybody to, to be as involved as humanly possible. Even maybe as, as God empowers you to do that. Because we have a message. We can't sit on it. We can't just stay put. we got to do something with it. Because a broken world is awaiting us. Um, I've asked that we uh, sing this song. Again, one of my other favorite songs, and you'll find I have a lot of favorite songs. But this is one that I really do, really, because I appreciate the words. The words have such depth and meaning. And it, it is a prayer. Take my life and let it be. All right? We want it to be used by Him. This is part of the idea being a worshiper with our whole life. It has to do with living at the Living in holiness. It has a lot to do with uh, our mission in this world. It has a lot to do with our discipleship. And we're going to sing that. I want you to sing this song as a prayer. And I hope that you can. I hope you can mean the words. Because if you're just singing a, singing a song, you're just making noise. It needs to be something that, that God uses within you and ch to change you, to transform you, to make you into the person that he created and redeemed you to be. So as we sing this song, I want to invite you to, uh, maybe as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, maybe there's a, uh, something that was said through your, your songs, with the, with the scripture, in the prayers, what have you. And maybe you, as this, even in the song, the song here, the Spirit is speaking to you and urging you to take, come to this place of prayer and to confirm, commit, recommit, whatever it is He's asking you to do. Man, don't be, don't be hesitant. Don't be anchored. Let Him move you. Let Him inspire and improve you. Let's sing together that first verse.
resonate with your spirit. Hope that you live that out in your daily life. Take my lot at myself that I will be ever, only, all for you. Stand with me, please. 